All right. So uh, I think we're going to do um, mostly aortic valve stuff today, and uh, another session we'll talk about mitral and uh, tricuspid. All, and you, you don't really have to do any, know anything about pulmonic valve, really, other than congenital stuff. So you can be done with that. All right. So now this is the new way. The you know we started looking at the valves, very similar to heart failure. So any type of valve disease is either stage A, me meaning the patient is at risk. For example, if it is you know bicuspid aortic valve for aortic stenosis, or then it starts sort of progressing. So that's stage B, and then with stage C, it now becomes severe but still asymptomatic, and then stage D it becomes symptomatic. If you uh, if you've seen heart failure, th there's the exact same classification for heart failure. So they, this is since 2014 the HAACC came up with that. So you guys look at this question and uh, find an answer, and then we'll look at all that stuff. So 70-year-old man, uh, referred for management of aortic stenosis, uh, retired recently, uh, walked for 30 minutes per day, denies any symptoms, the exertional limitation, angina, syncope, echo showed velocity of 3.5 meters per second, valve area of one centimeter, uh, square EF of 60% and some LVH. Exam was basically no hypertension, no vascular disease, but he had that grade 3 over 6 systolic ejection murmur at the base of the heart would radiate into the carotids. S2 was preserved. There is an S4 and there's no evidence of uh, uh, you know, volume overload. So which one would you recommend? You follow exam yearly and uh, obtain echo if exam changes. Repeat echo in three years, repeat echo in a year, or follow up exam uh, if he only develops symptoms. Who's going to go for one? Show of hands. Repeat echo in a year. I guess more, everybody's going that way. Follow exam if only symptom develops. No one likes that. Okay. I guess you were all right. So the answer is uh, um, repeat echo in a year. Um, so uh, what you have here is a, a, a moderate, moderate to severe aortic stenosis. And this is really what you need to know for everything valve disease, right? No matter what type of valve disease is. If it's mild, three to five years follow up with echo. If it's moderate, one to two year. And if severe, usually one year, sometimes, you know, you do it more. See, for mitral rigors, they talk about six months. But just one year for severe, six months to a year. One to two years for moderate, three to five years for mild. That's how you follow up patients with exam and echocardiogram. Okay, so again, something general for all valve diseases. Um, so uh, this is for uh, basically, you know, um, infective endocarditis prophylaxis, right? So the only, if you can see, the only class one indication if, if, is if you have rheumatic heart disease. And uh, basically, then you need to have uh, secondary prevention, especially if it's mitra involved, but any type of valve. So you, you can get rheumatic heart disease in the aortic valve or in tricuspid valve. Uh, it's also reasonable to do that when you're planning for a dental procedure for somebody who's got a prostatic, pro prostatic aortic valve or any prosthetic material, so that would be a valve repair. It's not the full valve, but there's something in there. Or somebody who's already had a previous endocarditis, or somebody who has unrepaired congenital, that's probably not something that, you know, even a general cardiologist would deal with. It's going to go mostly to adult congenital. But if you have unrepaired or if it's partially repaired with some residual disease, or if somebody does heart transplant and uh, develops valve disease. So that's, that's reasonable. And there's nothing that you do for anything non-dental. So TEE, EGD, colonoscopy, cystoscopy, that stuff. You don't need to. So really the only one class one indication is if you've already had rheumatic heart disease, especially in the mitral valve. And a uh, bunch of reasonable ones, just remember that prosthetic valves or any type of work on the valve with some prosthetic material, some congenital disease that's not completely resolved uh, or treated. What about afibrid valvular disease? You've all heard of you know, non-valvular disease, no acts or do acts. Um, so basically, vitamin K antagonist uh, for uh, mitral stenosis. Uh, so that, when we say non-valvular disease, what we mean by valvular disease is really mitral stenosis. And you can add to that uh, mechanical uh, mitral valve, right? So when we say valvular, non-valvular disease, what we actually imply is valvular disease is mitral stenosis and mechanical 
uh, mitral valves, and that's the, or, or any type of mechanical valve. So that's the indication for vitamin K antagonist. Everything else, you could do NOAX or you could do um, a vitamin K antagonist. Um, and that would be basically the same criteria you use for atrial fibrillation. Okay, so if you want to just learn one thing and just done be, be, with, with that, um, with the whole this lecture, and the next one that's going to be in a couple of weeks, that's all on this slide. So how do you treat valvular disease? So you, on, you, don't, you don't do anything about it. Drugs don't work. You only start treating if patient becomes severe, uh, develops severe valvular disease, and that severe valvular disease is symptomatic. So severe and symptomatic. Now I have something in parentheses here because that also applies most of the time, not always. You, may, you could have severe disease that's not symptomatic yet, but on echo you see progressive change in your heart, whether that's ejection fraction or whether that's dilation. So that's really, this applies to every type of bowel disease, right? Aortic stenosis, mitral, regurge, aortic regurge, anything. When it becomes severe and symptomatic, then you have to do something about it. Okay. So, heart anatomy, you know all of that. Know that, and we'll look at this uh, uh, down, down the line th during this lecture. Acute and chronic diseases are different. Uh, we don't deal with them the same way, so we'll go through that. Let's start with something about aortic stenosis. Okay, so uh, let me go back to the previous slide here. Uh, so valvular, supravalvular, and subvalvular. Most of what we deal with is valvular. Supravalvular and subvalvular, it's in the textbook. Hardly ever you see. I have an example here of, so this is the aortic valve, and you see it as if you have another aortic valve right underneath that. So this is just one example for you guys to see. By the way, this could be a board question uh, for echo. Uh, with echo, the, the, uh, the, you know, the apex of the triangle is where your uh, probe is, okay? So this, is, this view is called parasternal long axis right under the uh, probe, so that would be, so this is the front of the chest, right? So what's this chamber? Right. Shout, right ventricle. What is this one then? Left ventricle. So what is this? Left atrium, that would be then mitral valve, and that would be aortic valve. So this is aorta. So they actually asked the structures, and I think if I remember, I did have that in my board, board exam. So. Uh, these are just very, some very basic echoes, but I'm just showing you an example of, yes, valvular, this could be subvalvular. This is a picture of supravalvular. That's about as much as you know. So let's talk, talk about the actual aortic valve stenosis. All right, so most of it is just degenerative. Yes, it could be rheumatic, rare. Um, bicuspid, not so rare, but, you know, again, for every 10 of um, degenerative that you see, you may see one bicuspid. Okay, so this is how a normal valve is. And just sort of some extra nugget of information. A normal valve area is about three to four square centimeters, okay? So then when it becomes stenotic, then you can see this is all calcified and this is all that opens up and this is when it's closed, right? Um, so some, this is the bicuspid aortic valve. So when it wants to open up like that, uh, this is the degen degenerative that you just saw again. This is the rheumatic. So there are differences. You guys don't have to know necessarily the difference as, as the morphology of that when you look at the, the echo, but there are differences there. The rheumatic disease usually involves, uh, uh, yeah, you guys see that? Okay, so that usually involves the commissures, so where the, the, those leaflets come together. That's where it gets involved with rheumatic disease. It's the same whether it's mitral or aortic valve. Extremely rare. Unicuspid is very difficult to diagnose. This is also extremely rare. You can see four of those, right? Quadricuspid. But focus on bicuspid and degenerative. This is 3D echo, and this is a bicuspid valve. Now, you'd see that thing here. That's a raffe. And that sometimes makes it difficult. If the raffe wasn't there, diagnosis of bicuspid valve would have been easy. The raffe makes you think, all right, is this really a raffe, or is this just a leaflet that's now completely, you know, frozen? Sometimes we call it functional bicuspid if we're not sure because we think, well, maybe this was open and now it's closed. Uh, but again, I, you know, you can see how it looks when it becomes stenotic and this is a pathology sample. C too complicated. I don't even know this, all this stuff, but the bicuspid valve, it can be different versions of that. So I'll have this, I'll share this as uh, the presentation with your uh, chiefs so that you guys can look at that. Uh, important epidemiology, less than 70 years, 50% is bicuspid valve, right? When you develop aortic stenosis. 
So if somebody listens seven years with aortic that could be a board question. Aortic stenosis is somebody who is 60 in their you know, fifth, sixth decade or seventh decade, uh, mostly bicuspid. And if you're more than 70, it's mostly degenerative. And you see the uh, other, other uh, parts also in there. Okay, so risk factor for aortic stenosis is the same as coronary disease, right? So all that stuff that you guys know. Uh, so you would think that uh, statins work. The statins do not work. It was, a, it was a hypothesis that, all right, so if this is the same risk factors, the same pathophysiology, maybe statins will help. Um, you could argue that maybe if you have people for 20 years, as soon as they start some evidence of that, but then when do you catch those patients? They are asymptomatic, they never come to you. But a couple of trials showed that they're not uh, basically helpful. Okay, so symptoms, again, most of the time asymptomatic. A lot of times you just pick up a murmur, right? When you listen to the patient, you get an echo. Um, and what do you call that when you pick up a murmur and the echo doesn't show any stenosis, but some calcification? Shout out. So you see calcification, you hear a murmur, and you get an echo, there's some calcification, but no stenosis. It's called aortic sclerosis, you guys have heard of that? Aortic sclerosis is basically the precursor of aortic stenosis. Okay, so symptoms of valvular heart disease, most of the time, are between uh, coronary disease and heart failure. Most of the time. So you, you don't, in fact, the one that usually causes uh, or can cause chest pain is the aortic stenosis. Everything else is really, when it becomes symptomatic, it's symptoms of heart failure that you're going to see. Okay, so it's nothing really you know, special about this. Uh, pay attention to that. This is uh, specific for, valvular, for aortic stenosis, syncope or presyncope, uh, and chest pain really mostly for here. Okay, so this is what you know about signs. Sometimes the board questions, they describe the murmur for you, uh, but they don't give you anything else. So you, probably, you do need to try to learn how things um, work with, uh, you know, in terms of physical exams. So I just have the most important things here. The, your pulse is slow rising, which is TARDIS, right? Um, and the, the, it, it's, its amplitude is reduced. So that's TARDIS a parvus that you've heard is basically that. It's basically a small posh, hard to examine, hard to find, um, and it's just very small and you know um, low amplitude. Okay, so murmur, everybody knows it's an ejection systolic murmur, meaning there's a small distance between your between your S1 and when the murmur starts, right? Um, and that can be heard basically across the precordium. The aortic stenosis is one that heard across the precordium, including in the apex, and that could be a sign. Uh, that could be a, a reason sometimes people get mixed up about MR and MS. Um, an important thing to know is when the second heart sound uh, disappears. If the second heart sound is gone, you probably have severe aortic stenosis. If you want to just know something, one thing about this is one thing that usually is uh, is you know a target for questions all the time. So if if the S2 has disappeared, and why is that? Because the valve is so calcified that you don't. You, you see, I've showed you the picture so that now you can imagine that valve is so calcified that nothing opens for the valve to make a sound. It has to open wide, and so when they come together, they clap and make a sound, right? When they're so calcified, there's just no sound there. Um, uh, the other thing is reverse splitting. So I'll, I'll leave that uh, for later on, maybe at the end of the talk we can talk about it. Um, but you, just remember, a slow pulse, the murmur is ejection systolic, and by the time the S2 is gone, that's severe. So obviously mild is not, but uh, down the line, when it becomes severe, it's gone. Uh, I'm just going to leave those here for you guys to look at if you want to. There's a big list of everything you would find in physical exam. Okay, so uh, what do you do? what's the natural history of aortic stenosis? This is the natural history. Nothing happens. You're perfectly fine until you start getting symptomatic, and then you fall off the cliff, right? So that's why... Now, this is none of the valvular diseases are as well as aortic stenosis described in terms of when I said beginning, you know, you don't do anything until they're symptomatic, and then you have to do something about it. So if you don't treat them when they're symptomatic, this is what happens. So if it's angina that they get in, and you don't treat it, at five years, half of them are dead. And if it's syncope, at three years, half of them are, yet, are, are dead. And if it's heart failure that they present with, at two years, half of them are dead. So that's how much time you have, depending on which presentation you catch. 
Okay, ECG, LVH, nothing special about it, right? And this is an echo. Again, you've seen that before. This was right ventricle, uh, right, uh, left ventricle, because that would be septum, mitral valve. The diagnosis of atrial stenosis, yes, there's, there's some you know, fancy stuff about measuring this and that and all these gradients and so on. But really, the first thing you need to see is actually, does this look stenotic or not? Because those, those formulas can be inaccurate. So first thing you look at is, as soon as you see this, you know you have aortic stenosis. Now you just have to characterize and quantify that, right? So it's obviously calcified, and you can see it's not really opening at all, right? Okay. And this is... Another echo view that's called apical view. So the parasternal is, you put the probe here on, on the side of this sternum, right? Apical, the probe is, sits at, right at the apex. So if you remember, we said the, the, yeah, the tip of the triangle is where the probe sits. So the probe is sitting right on top of the apex. So this would be what? What is this chamber? Left ventricle. Then this would be right ventricle. This would be left atrium, right atrium, and this is the aortic valve. And again, you can see the calcification there, right? Okay, so in cath, this is how you're gonna see this. This is normal, so when the valve opens, the pressure in the LV and aorta is normal, is, is the same. That makes sense, right? There's a, con a continuation of two chambers, normal pressures, when, that's when the valve is normal. And you all are familiar with A-lines and how they look, right? So that red is the, the way A-line always look on the monitor in ICU. Uh, and the blue one is the uh, left ventricle. And as you can see, there's no difference between the two. Now, when you have aortic stenosis, that's what's going to happen. So uh, this is basically um, uh, this one over here is the aorta, all right? So I have the 138 here, right? So this is the aorta, and this is the left ventricle. So in other words, the pressure, when you measure your pressure with severe stenosis and you have 130 systolic, and you have that gradient, inside the left ventricle, the pressure is 180, okay? So that difference is the gradient. And uh, the, what, what's in, in, in green can be me, it can get, basically give you an average. So you can gra measure the gradient at peak, you can measure it at any time point, or you can just get a mean gradient, which is what you really have to care about. Um, so again, say, I saw, showed you the slide in the beginning, right? Stage A is of, you know, when, it, when you have bicuspid aortic valve for a valve disease, for aortic valve aortic stenosis. The progressive is when you start having mild to moderate aortic stenosis and then becomes asymptomatic to severe, that's stage C, and then becomes symptomatic to severe, stage D. Um, and this is what we have in terms of, uh, now obviously symptoms are not in this table, right? But the severity, this may be a question for the board. So the th two things you want to remember is this mean gradient, uh, it's less than 20, 20 to 40, more than 40, right? So mild, moderate, severe. And then the valve area, 1.5 to 2. Remember I said 3 to 4 centimeters square, right, is the normal. So 1.5 to 2 is mild. 1 to 1.5 is moderate, less than 1 is severe. So just those two to have in mind could be a board question. Um, okay, so this I, I just leave this here. We're not going to go over that. This is a long-winded version of exactly that table, um, coming right from the guidelines. Um, okay, all of that. So now we have something called low output, low gradient AS. Has anybody heard of that before? Low output, low gradient. So I said, high, you know, severe AS is when your gradient is more than 40, and your valve area is less than one. So sometimes you have somebody with a great with a valve area that's less than one, so it meets that. Uh, criteria, but the gradient is not less than is not more than forty. The gradient is less than forty. That's called low output, low gradient severe stenosis. So basically, the two ways that that can happen. One way is that your EF is 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 low. Think about it as somebody uh, as a pump that's just not strong enough. So this valve can open more than one centimeter in terms of surface area, but that pump is just weak. So, in other words, what you see is pseudostenosis. There's a way to deal with that. You do a dobutamine stress echo, you can figure this out, right? So this is called low gradient, low output, low gradient aortic stenosis. 
Then there's another t- type that's called paradoxical low output low gradient. By the way, this may not come in you know, it may not be in your boards, probably not. But kind of interesting to to know there's you know there are some nuances to this stuff. Okay, so basically with W to mean you can figure it out. You make the heart beat stronger, right? Uh, can contract stronger. And if that, that's pseudo, then it basically shows itself. And if it's real, it shows itself. Okay. The other type, though, is somebody who has, still, who has normal ejection fraction. Oh, no, this is still that. Um, yeah, I, I guess I don't have an extra slide for that. So this is, um, so this is the low EF bar. There is another type that's called paradoxical low flow low gradient, which is so you have normal EF. And you have gradients of less than 40, but your valve area is like 0.8. So it looks like severe, but the gradient is not there. Usually happens in little old ladies, okay? So they have just very, these very small ventricles. There's really not much blood in there for you because of years of hypertension and this aortic stenosis. So the volume, the stroke volume that comes out of this heart is just very small. You don't have that option of the medium here. You have to make a judgment call if, this, if you think this is uh, uh, you know, severe. Basically, the way we deal with the other one, the, with this paradoxical, when your EF is normal, is we go based on some symptoms. If we're convinced that the patient has symptoms, we assume that this is a severe aortic stenosis. Okay. All right. Medical treatment doesn't exist, right? So that's what we said. Medical treatment for valvular disease just does not exist. Yes, if there is hypertension, uh, you know, you treat that. After you do after load reduction, uh, you got to be careful with that, though. Um, so, uh, if you drop the afterload, uh, if you think about, um, you know, somebody with aortic stenosis, so they have this very tiny hole through which they have to inject the blood. And if you drop their blood pressure, they're going to gonna have to be able to feel all of this vascular system for, that to, to, for the heart to be able to counteract this. And a heart that has that very hole, small hole to basically eject is not able to do that. So, this is something that in hospital you've got to be very careful with your afterload reduction. So what is your typical afterload reduction? ACE and nitroglycerin. So you want to be very careful with aortic stenosis. Practical point in a hospital may be a question in the board. You want to be very careful. So you could use something IV. For example, you can use nitroglycerin drip or nitroprosat because as soon as something goes uh, you know, south, you can always turn it off. It's out of your system within five minutes. So just remember you got to be pretty careful with that. Okay. This is a uh, courtesy of Dr. Brown, how to not kill a patient with critical aortic stenosis. Um, so examine for giving nitroglycerin. AS is preload dependent. So we said after load, you can't do anything about it with aortic stenosis because that valve is tight, right? Preload is basically your volume, right? So a lot of times when they're critical, they come with heart failure. We said heart failure is the worst of the symptoms for, for this. So when you want to treat the heart failure, how do you do? You use nitroglycerin, you diurese them, just do that slowly. That's the whole point. Be very careful, be thoughtful that this is not, not your classical uh, heart failure patient. If your heart failure patient has severe aortic stenosis, you have to have everything done very slowly and thoughtfully so that you don't overdo it or you don't do it, uh, do it fast. Okay, so this valvuloplasty thing is very rarely used. So basically the idea is, okay, I'm going to put a balloon in, in that valve and just blow it open and that will buy me some time so that I can figure out what I want to do. You, we used to do that more often now with, you know, TAVR. A lot of times you just don't do that. You just go straight to what, uh, you know, can fix the problem altogether. Okay. Surgical treatment, very easy, right? You just replace the valve. So um, this valve a lot to me is that, that balloon that I, you know, I, I mentioned just uh, in a minute ago. Um, and these are, this, this, is what you, this slide is what you know from surgical. All of the class ones, this could be board question. The two A's and two B's and all that stuff, don't worry about it. All right, so class one. Uh, recommended, what we, what, what, what we said was what? Symptomatic and severe, right? So that's exactly what it says. Severe, high gradient aortic stenosis with symptoms, right? So easy. Uh, asymptomatic, we said if it's symptomatic, if it's, as, if it's severe but you see changes in your heart, that's another indication frequently, so that's, num- that's number two there. So asymptomatic, but you now see that your EF is less than 50% on echo. Patient says, I'm perfectly fine. That's a class one indication. And if you're sending your patient for something else, you have severe AS, and now you discovered three vessel disease, and the patient's gonna get cabbage. 
you're going to wait until this is symptomatic in a year time and then open the chest again. That's sort of common sense, right? So if the patient needs something else to be done, you might as well take In fact, uh, now, again, I said don't worry about 2As. So a moderate aortic stenosis with somebody who needs to have their chest open is a 2A indication. So I have the 2As and all of that stuff here, so you, you can look at it. Or you can look at this complicated, this is basically all of that in an algorithm. Uh, but really what you care about is this class 1, which is symptomatic severe aortic stenosis, which is what you need to know. Okay. Um, now TAVR. So right now, what is the indications for TAVR? So we started with uh, prohibitive risk in terms of surgery. Um, and so these were patients who were not going to get any surgery done. So that was done, partner one trial, and now it's class one indication, right? So prohibitive risk. And then they gradually just cut the risk down. So high risk, they can still get valvular surgery, it's just that the risk is high. So they tested those in partner two trial, and, and now it's a class one, and surgical aortic valve replacement is also a class one indication, right? So SAVR and TAVR, both are indication for high risk patients. And then they went to intermediate risk, so that's partner three, and now have, there's one trial for that, so TAVR is a class 2A, but you know, intermediate risk surgical is still a class one, probably as we get more. So if you remember, for some, something to be a class one, you need more than one randomized controlled trial. So we have one already for intermediate risk. Uh, what we don't know, really know for, about TAVR is long-term follow-up. So if you, you get a TAVR to a 50-year-old, how long is this going to last? The idea is probably the same as any other bioprostatic valve, so that's about you know, 10, 15 years. But the good thing is you have option to do valve in valve. So, um, you know, but we, we, get, we have to get long-term follow-up data to see what happens. And now there's an ongoing trial for low-risk population. So low-risk population does not have a TAVR option right now. But there's an ongoing trial that, in fact, uh, a Jewish, um, the cardiothoracic surgery are enrolling for that trial for low-risk patients. So we'll see what that shows. That's going to be a bit of a tough sale, again, for that reason, because the low-risk population, that 50-year-old, if, if that patient gets a metallic valve, it's going to be good for the rest of their lives. But if you do a TAVR, uh, the, you know, the upside is you don't have your chest crack open. You go to hospital, you get discharged at 48 hours. So uh, there is some value for that, but um, uh, you know, we'll see how that, how that goes. And this, these are the two ones, uh, the two types that we have here in, in the U.S. In, in Europe, there's like five or six different companies. This is the Medtronic self-expanding. And uh, so it basically expands by itself. And this is uh, and, and the uh, Edward Sapien. That was the first one that came to the market. The valve is on top of a balloon. And so you cross the wire across the valve. When you're sure it's in the right position, you just open up the balloon. So it just basically crash, uh, you know, crushes that process, the native, native uh, calcified valve against the wall. And this, uh, this scaffolding will hold that in place. All of that calcium helps that the scaffolding stays in place and doesn't embolize. Okay. Complication of the aortic macular stenosis is complication of any type of heart disease, right? AFib, heart failure, all that stuff. Nothing really special about this. Sudden death is something special for aortic stenosis. Probably rare for other ones. Possible to see that with acute aortic regurg, acute mitral regurg. That's not really sudden death for them. It's for them, you know, a sort of acute emergency and you don't catch, catch up with them, they'll die in a few hours sometimes. But with aortic stenosis, you do develop sudden, sudden death, especially if you don't, um, you know, if you don't treat them where they become symptomatic. Um, the mechanism is not really known. It could be arrhythmia for all we know. Um, but it can also be other things related to hemodynamics. But as I said, I don't think that's going to be anything that, uh, you know, would be a question in the boards. Heidi syndrome. Uh, this is a Dr. Heidi who described this in the uh, first time around, which was basically patients with aortic severe aortic stenosis developing GI bleed. This is, this is a phenomenon that, that we still see to the day. Rare, I have to say, I haven't, at least, um, maybe we should ask, about the question, or ask that question from patients more often. I have not seen one for years now. And it's basically uh, this, that the turbulence of blood going through the, uh, the valve causes uh, the von Willebrand factor to, uh, uh, so it, it's basically for a multimer, and those multimers will break and that becomes an acquired form of Willenbrand disease, which is, you know, in terms of what you see, is the same as a, a congenital one. 
Um, and it's basically directly related to severity of valve disease. Um, uh, and it gets better when you have the valve replacement. However, as you can see, after surgery, two-thirds of patients will have that back, the ones who had it within six months. So one thing to bear in mind is any type of prosthetic valve is never as good as your original valve, right? The prosthetic valve, the valve area, when it's brand new, goes in there, it's still less than, uh, to most of the time, in fact, less than 1.5 centimeters. So I remember the numbers, three to four is normal, and you start calling valvular stenosis when it's less than two for, mitro, for aortic stenosis, right? 1.5 to two is mild, one to 1.5 is moderate. So what I'm telling you is when you give somebody a prosthetic valve, you're giving them, you're, you're giving them a moderate aortic stenosis instead of their severe aortic stenosis they have. So bear in mind, aortic stenosis, you know, this, is this good enough? Most of the time it is. You know, again, you can, you, uh, a lot of patients with severe aortic stenosis remain asymptomatic for years. So yes, this is good enough. But remember, the problem is that that moderate aortic stenosis may not last as long as a native moderate aortic stenosis because this is all prosthetic material. So the age of a prosthetic valve, uh, if it's not mechanical, is about 10 to 15 years for that reason. So you start with usually a moderate aortic stenosis on day one when you get a new prosthetic valve. All right. Um, so aortic valve sclerosis, we just talked about it, right? So it's basically something that you either pick up by exam, you, you hear a murmur, or you get an echo and you see that there. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, it, it matters. Yes, it does, because first of all, risk of progression of aortic stenosis. Second of all, we talk about the mechanism, you know, pathophysiologically, aortic stenosis and coronary disease are the same. So you see calcium anywhere in the valves in the heart, that means that your patient is high risk. So that's another aspect of, as a primary care physician or a preventive cardiologist, it's important to know, if you ever saw calcium in any of the, don't blow it off, that means that you have a patient that you have to start thinking about, okay, is there anything else about staffing I have to do? Maybe the cholesterol is good, maybe I'm gonna get a CT coronary calcium score and quantify the degree of their atherosclerosis to make a decision about that. So. Um, that's there. All right, so another question. Let's uh, do this. So 84-year-old widow, retired teacher, comes to see you with chest discomfort and near syncopal episode while climbing stairs, has hypertension and hyperlipidemia as a uh, uh, past history, as, uh, as a past, his past medical history on ACTZ and atelinol. So you have a heart rate of 60, 155 over 76 is your blood pressure, JVP of 11 centimeters, normal is anything less than eight. Uh, brisk upstroke, fine by basal crackles, and normal S1, harsh late peak systolic murmur, systolic murmur at right upper sternal border obscuring the S2. So this is, this is the critical part about the question, right? Obscuring the S2. So ECG, uh, whatever, uh, echo, uh, EF, normal, and estimate of value of 0.6. So what would you do about it? Refer to EP uh, for possible ICD. Anybody for that? Be begin at orvastatin? No? Okay. R refer for valvoplasty? Refer for a coronary angiography for anticipation of aortic valve replacement? Two, three, four, okay. Initiate hospice referral, palliative care. So the rest, I guess, uh, we'll probably go for hospice if that, because you don't have any other option. Yeah, so the answer is D. So, yes, yeah, this is a patient that needs valve replacement, right? So, yes, near syncope, pre-syncope, patients becoming symptomatic. The valve area is less than, you know, less than one. Um, so, you know, easy question, but basically a real scenario. Uh, this happens, um, uh, believe it or not, it, you know, I've, I've seen patients presented like this to internal medicine department. Exactly like this. 85, I just passed out, you know, two days ago. You listen and you hear the murmur and that's it. Well, all that's, you have the answer. Okay. So 31-year-old man comes to follow up uh, with bicuspid aortic valve, but, and you know he has severe aortic regurgitation. Nothing else in past history. He gets yearly echoes, continues to feel well. He has no symptoms, works full times runs three times a week, about 30 minutes, uh, and nothing is changing. His exercise tolerance, none of that stuff. So he looks good, uh, height and all that good. Blood pressure is 145 over 50, so you have wide pulse pressure, and a heart rate of 60. So we know he has bicuspid valve severe AI, right? 
So a 98% long is all good. You have the murmur one over six systolic murmur at left sternal border, and then you have the uh, decrescendo systolic diastolic murmur, and you don't have any edema. So you get, you get an echo, and it's 5.2 centimeters and systolic dimension. But it was 4.7 about a year ago, it was 4.4 two years ago. So you see that uh, this is the example of an evalve disease who's getting the structural changes in your heart. Uh, EF is still remain normal. No, actually EF is also reduced, 50%. Right, from normal for men is uh, more than 52, for women is more than 53, that's the new thing. But you know, 50 is just low normal. Okay, so now you say that's reasonable to proceed with valve replacement in the near future, and you arrange for an appointment to see a cardiac surgeon. So what are you gonna do? Coronary angiography, stress test, MRI of the brain vasculature, or CT of the chest? Yeah, vasculature, yeah, you might wanna map the vasculature, so why would you wanna do that? Now, we haven't addressed this one. This, there's a new thing in there. So why do you need to map the vasculature? You're right, absolutely, the answer is D. You gotta get a CT scan. Anybody? Okay, so here's the answer. So, by cost of the aortic valve, patients have high incidence of aortic aneurysm. So every time you see a by cost of the aortic valve, you have to think about that. Um, ideally, you want to know if that's the case. With echo, you can actually get the beginning of your ascending aorta. That, a lot of times, is, is all you need. But when you come to the time it gets closer to surgery, you, then you really want to know if you're dealing with that, because obviously your surgeon needs to know that. Uh, angiogram wasn't the case here because he's only 31 years old, so most of the time you don't need to do that. So that's, that's the correct answer. Okay. All right. Uh, so we're, yeah, we're getting to the end. All right. So aortic regurgitation. So uh, we said, remember about the aortic stenosis, bicostity, and degenerative. Uh, here, the, the etiology is a little bit different. So primary aortic valve disease. So uh, think about uh, mitral valve prolapse, so you can kind of have similar pathologies as a primary disease in, in the aortic valve. Or you can have aortic root, uh, root abnormalities. So basically the aorta, aortic roots get so dilated that these leaflets can't come together, right? They can't basically cause a closure. And that could be uh, you know, congenital, or could be related to dissection, or could be related to syphilis, something that probably you don't see these days that often. Um, it could be related to Marfan's disease, obviously something that you see these days quite often with the epidemic of uh, drug abuse, infective endocarditis, um, could be related to inflammatory diseases such as SLE, uh, or rarely uh, a tumor on the valve just causes malcoaptation of, of those leaflets. Most of the time, what you deal with is, is basically you know, those two in the beginning, primary valve disease and root abnormalities. Marfan, you probably see that once in a while, but not, uh, not that often. So, same story as aortic stenosis, right? Asymptomatic for decades. And uh, again, the symptoms are usually symptoms of heart failure. AS had the you know, angina and, and syncope there in addition to that, but everything else from here on is really symptoms of heart failure when, when it becomes symptomatic. Okay, so signs important because again, that could be the way it's described in, in the board questions. They just give you what you would hear. So you're going to get a wide pulse pressure, so your low diastolic and an elevated systolic, right? Uh, similar to this guy that we had here, right? His blood pressure was um, 145 over 50, right? So you have a wide pulse pressure. Uh, this rapid rise and fall is called a water hammer uh, pulse. Um, if you look at the, the list of the signs of aortic regurgitation, there are about 10 of those. Each one of them has a fancy name, so they don't really usually ask you that question, so I haven't in included that here. But the, the wide pulse pressure and this rise and fall uh, is something you could, you could probably notice. So the way you notice the rise and fall is you get your, your hand over a patient's uh, brachial artery and you lift the hand to the, the arm up and you're gonna notice that the intensity of the pulse, you know, beating against your, your hand is going to be increased. So you just feel a hyperdynamic pulse, uh, pulse that gets more intense when you lift up the arm. Um, all right, so that's wide pulse pressure and the rapid rise and fall. Um, late stage, you may get displacement of, of the PMI. 
that happens in either aortic regurg or mitral regurg. So anything that causes volume overload for the left ventricle, those two things for mitral disease are the ones that do that. Aortic stenosis causes pressure overload, not, my, not volume overload. So M, M, uh, MR and AI or AR will do that. So that's, that causes the displacement. In the auscultation, and the position for that, by the way, is you want to have the patient sit forward and lean forward, take a deep breath in, breathe out, and hold, right? So you want to listen to them at end of expiration. Generally speaking, if you have a difficult murmur to hear, you want to put your stethoscope and tune in. So tune it in is you want to, you will get everything out of your mind and focus on the heart. That takes about five to 10 seconds, depending on the person. And then you ask the patient to do their maneuver. Uh, this is more important when you have something that's subtle, something, something like S3, S4, or diastolic murmurs like rumble of the mitral stenosis or uh, the murmur of aortic regurgitation. Okay, so you have the diastolic murmur that you listen that, to that at this position. Now, remember the position because they may describe this in, in, the, uh, in the stem of the question, and that if they describe it that, they, you, have, you, know, you know what it is you're dealing with. Um, and again, when it gets advanced, you can get uh, S3 gallop um, uh, like any other cause of LV dilation. So, that, that's, so this one, the displacement or the gallop is not specific for aortic regurgitation. It's the evidence, it's the evidence of development of heart failure. And then there's reverse splitting. So we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute, I guess, for both AS and AR. Uh, again, I have all the different signs here for you when you look at the, this presentation if you were interested. So... Uh, that's what you're going to see. Um, so this, you see, you've seen this view before. This is called the five chamber because you see the aorta also. So again, you see the left ventricle, right ventricle. Uh, this could be a board question. Again, they'll ask you what these chambers are, left atrium, right atrium, and this is the aortic valve. And as you can see in diastole, blood the jet is going backwards. This is just a still picture of that parasternal long axis, the one that we looked at in the beginning of the presentation, is right ventricle, left ventricle, aorta, left atrium, and again, you see that jet here in, in uh, diastole. Okay. So, uh, medical therapy doesn't exist. Again, same thing. Really, there's nothing that medical therapy means. You certainly, you know, routine vasodilation, vasodilate, th this was the thing. People thought that maybe if you do cause vasodilatory or use vasodilatory drugs, meaning calcium channel blockers and AC inhibitors, then you may be able to reduce the afterload and then you'll have less aortic regurgitation. Yes, that probably theoretically is accurate, but never really has panned out. So by itself, it's not an indication, but in the AHA ACC guidelines, they say treat hypertension. Now, if you had hypertension you wanted to treat, well, that's a different story. So for that, for these patients, use ACE, ARB, or calcium channel blockers, because those are the ones that will reduce your afterload. So yes, if you're treating hypertension, but you're not going to use this. So if the question was saying, yeah, you got a patient with blood pressure 150 over 90, and you know, mild to moderate aortic regurgitation, use ACE, ARB, yes, but you're treating hypertension, right? But if the blood pressure was 120 over 80, no, you don't use any of that stuff. And obviously, if patient develops heart failure, then you treat heart failure, right? So it's not because you're treating aortic regurgitation, you're treating heart failure, right? So there's not really no medical therapy. Yes, there's just some, uh, you know, suggestion of using this castle channel blocker. Don't use, you know, uh, HCTZ as your face agent if you have aortic regurgitation. Uh, it's a minor point, but um, just something to bear in mind. Okay, surgical therapy, you know, how, how difficult is that? You just replace the valve, right? Okay, same story. Remember, we said valvular heart disease, you treat it when it's severe and symptomatic. So look at this. This is the HA ACC guidelines, symptomatic uh, and severe, right? Symptomatic with severe AI, regardless of LDC systolic function. So symptomatic, symptoms trump everything else. If it's asymptomatic, then you look at um, uh, LV systolic function. The other one that you could look at is that example that we had with the, the young guy with, um, with, with aortic regurgitation uh, and bicuspid valve. So his, his ventricle was getting dilated, right? So that's a class 2A in there. But just look at class 1s always. That if, if there's going to be any question for you guys in board, it's going to be class 1 indications. And this third one is the same thing as the other one. If you're going to have the chest crack open, you might as well treat this if it's severe, even if it's patient is asymptomatic. 
Okay, so two A's and two B's, and this is for you guys to look at if you wanted to. So there is no such thing as acute aortic stenosis. Probably not. I guess you can imagine something may happen. Uh, I've never heard of it, never looked it up to see if somebody's ever done a case report of something that would cause acute aortic stenosis, but it's hard to believe how would you, how would you get out. I guess you get a you know, giant endocarditis somehow that can cause that, but then how is that, is that going to be acute? That's probably not existent, right? But aortic regurgitation actually does exist, acute, acute aortic regurgitation, and it's a medical emergency, right? Uh, I'm sorry, it's a surgical emergency. So uh, we had one patient recently, so there was this guy who was um, in his 70s and was at home and just spoke the pop. Literally, he, that's how he described it. He felt the pop and started getting short of breath. So he comes to the hospital, he gets an echo, and he got, he's got a primary valve failure. So nobody knows exactly why this happened. He didn't have anything else to explain that. Just the valve, you know, he, he had a, a primary rupture of his aortic valve. Um, with no, there was no, uh, you know, endocarditis or dissection, nothing. It was just primary valve. Very rare. It's mostly either a dissection or endocarditis. And these patients basically come with cardiogenic shock in florid pulmonary edema. So that, because the, the difference between this and a chronic aortic regurgitation is that chronic, your, va your ventricle sort of develops that capacity, dilates, and is able to absorb. Now, you have a you know, virgin ventricle, basically, who is basically not seeing these high volumes and all of a sudden gets this torrential aortic regurgitation, what do you think is going to happen? Everything is going to back up, go into the lungs and cause pulmonary edema. So this is, you, you have to deal with that. These patients will frequently need to be intubated in CCU for just half an hour, an hour, while you're getting your surgeons or somebody else to come to take care of this. Now, this one case that we had, um, he got an emerging tap. And he did fantastic. He went home the next day um, after after his uh, valve. Now, TAVR for aortic regurgitation, uh, you know, uh, it's not uh, FDA approved, so so it's an off-label use. Uh, but you know, in that situation, that's what he chose to go for, and uh, worked out perfectly fine, at least at short term. But you know, in the CCU, you intubate them, you try to. Now we said after reduction doesn't work. Well, that's all you have now uh, for that you know, half an hour, hour, two hours, whatever time you have to manage the patient while you're waiting to, for the surgeon to come in or for things to get moving. Um, so these are the patients, ideally, if, this, if, you, if you've made the diagnosis, you want to get the patient to a, a to an ICU in a hospital that has surgeons available, right? You don't want them to be here, for example, you want to send them over to Jewish hospital. Um, make sure you let your attendant know about that. Okay, so let's do this question. 45 year old, uh, comes in with shortness of breath that's been increasing over six months and now he's, uh, he's a contractor so he struggles to climb his scaffoldings uh, he's got a pound in his chest and neck he's only got hypertension, nothing else his exam, blood pressure is 160 over 50 so you see the white pulse pressure rapidly collapsing pulse that's the water hammer pulse that we're talking about subtle head nod nodding and uh, he's got an S3 at the apex with the murmur, which is decrescendo, leaning forward in expiration. Echo shows an EF of 50%. He's got a bicuspid aortic valve, four grade, four plus AR. And what are you gonna do with this? That's, that's easy. What's the answer? A, B, C, D? C. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you.